So I'd like to welcome Professor Julia Gillen from Lancaster University. Julia is a Professor of Literacy Studies and Director of the Lancaster Literacy Research Centre. Uh, she directs the Edwardian Postcard Project and is a keen collector of postcards, as her research suggests. And her current research also concerns very young children's engagement with digital media. And she's running a deaf multiliteracy project in India, Ghana and Uganda. That sounds fascinating. So with no further ado, on to Julia. Thank you very much for that wonderful welcome. I hope I didn't write that because I'm certainly not running the project in India, Ghana and Uganda. I'm just taking a, a part in it. But anyway, that's uh, completely different. So thank you very much for inviting me here today to talk about Edwardian postcards. Um, can I ask, can you see the presentation? I've just got a slightly different view than um, than we had just now when I practised. Yeah, we can see that oh. fine. Great. OK, thank you. So you can see the early 20th century postcards um, featured cat memes and uh, many others as well. Look, but I'm particularly interested today in how they reveal um, marginalised 20th century English working class cultures. So I'm going to talk about what Edwardian postcards are and why they're of interest. Um, briefly, steps in digitisation, um, how we how we gathered what I'm now calling the main collection and then how I'm looking onwards to work with crowdsourcing. The main thing I'm going to be talking about is how the cards give an insight into two working class women at the beginning of the 20th century. Ruby Ingrie, who lived in um, the centre of very urban London, and Annie Parrish, who lived in an extremely remote Lincolnshire area. And then, of course, I'll be happy to um, answer any questions. So the Edwardian postcard was the social media platform of its day, um, called Edwardian because it just so happens that the heyday of the uh, postcards was 1901 to 1910, which coincides with the reign of Edward VII. And here's a typical card that shows you why I can make a claim that they were something like social media. It was sent in Lockerbie and it says, hope to see you this evening, love Nessie. So we've got the short message and a picture and the person could send it with the certainty that it would arrive you know, very, very quickly. So why do I research this? Well, partly because there's a neglect of a uh, study of everyday writing of lower social groups. Um, there are, as I've suggested, comp interesting comparisons to be made with today's social media. There are new digitization um, opportunities and in general, it fits into Lancaster Literacy Research Centre programme of research on vernacular um, literacies. That's everyday literacies which arise, as it were, from below rather than having um, uh, standards and conventions um, imposed upon them. So in the Edwardian era, it was a time of great change and a great consciousness of change. I mean, that really comes out when you look at um, uh, primary sources. Um, we have a newly literate society. Uh, increased cheap and efficient travel. The railways were at their absolute zenith in Britain, um, more railway operate in, in operation than ever before or since. A sense, as I've suggested, of rapid technological and social change, and perhaps you can see that by the, um, the top card. Cheap paper had become much cheaper, so it was much easier and cheaper to print colour postcards, although the one at the bottom right um, would have been expensive and sophisticated then and is now relatively expensive and sophisticated to collect. And most of all, there were extraordinarily efficient postal services. So if you lived in London, for example, there might be up to 10 deliveries a day. If you lived somewhere like Lancaster, you could have six. Potentially, a postcard might arrive at any time on your doormat between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., um, six days a week. So the world's first postcard in 1869, very quickly brought into Britain, was immediately a really attractive and popular object. Why attractive? Why popular when it looks so plain? Sorry, I don't know why the slideshow keeps running away with me. It's not, not my finger. Um, and um, uh, why was it so popular? And the answer is, is because it contrasted in its portability and small size with the letter. So people had learned at school how to write letters, what to do, all the etiquette of them. This with a postcard, you didn't have the space to do that. So you had to um, use it for a short message and that was immediately appealing. So the next most important date is um, 1894, 
which was when you start to get pictures on postcards. So you can see that people reacted in various ways. Uh, the one on the left has managed to chime an enormous amount in it. And uh, the one on the right uh, is a much briefer message. Dear sister, I have left O, that's Oxford, and am now in Reading Station, love David. And that was sent by D David to his sister, Mary Evans, who lived in Camberwell. I that Teams comes up with um, unexpected uh, functionalities and problems that you've never met before. I've never met the uh, self-propelling uh, slideshow before, but I'll uh, do my best to control it. So January 1902 is a very important uh, change because we've got the divided back. So the whole of them, the front side can be a picture like that one top right. Um, and you could use the, the other side was half used for the um, addressee's name and address. And of course, the postmark that's so useful today for giving us information about the place, time and date of sending and the other half for the message. And I've calculated using the Postmaster General's reports that in the reign of Edward VII, six billion cards were sent, which is around 200 per person. Um, so given the fact that obviously there were many people that couldn't send cards, couldn't write them, um, the very young, the very old, the underclass and so forth, it is testament to their tremendous popularity. And here's one which, as you see, this seems to be relatively little relationship, as far as I can tell, to the picture side. Maybe they just had a stack and chose them. But it shows, as so often, the, the spontaneity and the speed of the cards in the message. So it's referring to things that will happen today. So it reads more like a, te a text message than, um, you know, than, than a holiday postcard of the mid 20th century, for example. So um, briefly, um, steps in digitization. Um, the main collection consists of 3,000 cards, which are postally used with names and addresses clear, sent between 1901 and 1910. They've been manually scanned, transcribed. We've captured various kinds of metadata in spreadsheets. And wherever possible, I've searched for the um, addressees and therefore quite often found the senders in censuses and added information where possible. And the collection will be entering Lancaster Digital Collections. In going forwards, I'm now um, crowdsourcing um, new cards and also help in transcription. And that's that's the website that's doing that. So that's really the way forwards. So then um, to Ruby Ingrid, um, my first uh, first of two people I want to um, introduce you to, as it were. So Ruby Ingrid at this point is living in London and this card is sent um, from her friend Arthur who is a sailor based most of the time in Chatham, Kent. He's actually a stoker. Sometimes, of course, his ship takes him away, um, particularly to Scotland for long sojourns. And the cards, because a number of cards, the messages tend to be very similar um, to this one, which is, I, I won't read them and you won't necessarily have time to read them all, um, I realise, but I just have to pull out a few salient points. So usually they're making arrangements to meet, or arrangements are cancelled, and they're talking about going out in their bikes. Um, cycling had percolated to the working class in the Edwardian age. So Ruby Ingrid then was born 1890. I have a total of 34 cards to her, from her, and in her family. Um, her father was a labourer in the metropolitan cattle market, um, and he was part of that huge migration from the countryside to, to the cities um, at the, towards the end of the Victorian age. The family frequently moved. There are many different changes of address, but they're always around the Caledonian Road, known as the Cali, um, and essentially centering on the father's work in the cattle market. Ruby left school and became a typist, which was quite a you know, promise, relatively promising occupation and a relatively modern one as well. So here's a card. Um, sent to Arthur Bodilo when he's on his uh, uh, ship, and it's sent actually from his sister Florrie. And it's about this, it's the summer holiday. Um, Florrie has been back to the countryside of, in the area that the family originally came from, so staying with relatives, and they've been very glad to go to the seaside and go on substantial cycle rides. Now, this is a card from Ruby, and interestingly, it's signed from she puts from Arthur and Ruby in effect. And it seems that Ruby has gone with Arthur to visit his family in the countryside. And it's again 
refers to the, the bikes, the cycles that they've taken with them. So um, this is actually uh, a card um, from Arthur to Ruby. Um, he's in Scotland. Um, the postcards are interwoven with letters, as many of the cards make, make clear. And here Arthur is presumably feeling rather sad and jealous of Ruby, who's now gone for a ride with Fred. Um, I can tell you if you're interested what eventually happens with Arthur and Ruby. But I'm now going to turn to um, Annie Parrish, um, another young woman uh, living on a farm. Um, she worked all her life, in, according to the censuses, as a general servant, but it seems that most of the time that was on her, her the farm where her um, uh, father works or in the house. But some of the time, as now, it would appear that she was working as a nanny looking after some children. So this seems to be a card to her um, from one of the children when they're on a holiday, possibly a privilege that you know she didn't have in the same way. Um, Ryder Haggard uh, was very concerned about the crisis in agriculture in the Edwardian age and um, undertook a most marvellous kind of what we now call now might call nowadays a mixed methods uh, study of the issue, including um, interviewing and uh, commissioning maps and so forth. So you Thettlethorpe is here, so very, very remote um, and they, they put on the maps what, what agricultural um, products and so forth and livestock are in the area. Um, and in general, he's um, depicting uh, uh, the countryside as being abandoned. It, uh, so sometimes it's referred to as a beautiful decay uh, when they're just looking at the hedges and so forth. And according to his um, interviewees, then farming is a failing industry. And one of them observes indeed that the young women go to the, go to the city first and the young men go after them. However, um, Annie did not. Um, she spent all her life um, in Lincolnshire in this area, um, eventually you know, living um, with, with a brother. However, uh, to go back a bit, what kind of things are in the Edwardian cards? And there's various different um, types of images, as we'll see. Um, this kind of thing was quite popular, really, a sort of uh, well, no, I won't try to describe it. You can decide what it is for yourself. Um, but uh, this this is sent to her by her sister, and it's about trying to make arrangements for them to meet, for them trying to get some leisure time to spend together, and also about the ill mother who lingers on for a few years, but then dies before 1910. Um, here's one from 1906, which gives you a slightly different picture. Um, I'm pretty sure it refers to, it's again sent, this is important, within Lincolnshire, so it's sent from in quite a close location, from one sister in one farm to another, to her sister. And yet, as you see, she's been able to obtain a postcard of London, showing a very different um, uh, sort of setting. And um, it refers to an Annie who is in London, who I'm pretty sure is Annie Parrish's niece. Um, but anyway, it does show then that going to London was, was um, feasible, I suppose, for some people. And the images of London life such as this one were very accessible. Here's a card in fact of Dublin, um, which um, perhaps not the most interesting message, but just to show again that they're collecting, um, they're sharing images of places that they wouldn't necessarily go to. Here's then another, another one, um, one might call it artistic or whatever, um, again refers to um, letters and people's doings and so forth. And it's quite hard to read, but it is interesting in that it refers to went to town hall last night to a lantern lecture and moving picture was lovely traveling about Scotland. So we can see some um, indication of um, shared uh, culture there. So I'd like to say then in conclusion that these Edwardian postcards reveal the voices of working class people in the early 20th century. They show ongoing connections between rural and urban lives um, after the great migration um, from the countryside to the city that so that was had such a massive impact on um, the Edwardian age. They show that Edwardian postcards um, with them, people could share meaningful images of all kinds, memes, um, cute cats, actresses, all sorts of topographical locations, um, whether or not, you know, salient locally, um, including from popular culture. 
and they were a speedy, cheap, multimodal means of communication. There was no parallel, there just was no parallel. There was no possibility in the intervening time um, between them and the late 90s um, to send a, a cheap, fast, colourful message. So I've just got a, a couple of references there and uh, welcome any, any questions or comments if, if we're taking them now. So thank you. Thanks very much, Julia. That was really interesting. Um, I think, as you say, the parallel between postcards and social media seems really strong. So we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, start with one for me, actually. So I was thinking, uh, looking at the postmarks on the postcards, and maybe this could apply to letters as well. Can you make meaningful maps from these? Um, is it possible to have a kind of map of sent and received, or does that end up just showing a map of where the post offices are? No, it doesn't, because you could. Um, you, it's it's very relevant to meaningful information because there were so many, um, so many more post offices and so many different places that cards could get postmarked. You could even post one if you were on a train, for example. So it's a really useful source of information. So I've I've indeed done what you done what you said in a very um, small scale. Um, as kind of a pilot um, working with a collection of actually an, another young woman um, to show it was to show it's feasible. And that's something I very much want to do in the future. I do well, want to plot the cards and I want to use them to find out more about the Edwardian social networks. Yeah, because yeah, that's what I was thinking was some sort of network analysis and then comparing with what we do with Twitter nowadays. Yes, it would be really cool. Yes, yes, I, I agree. That's what I'd like to do. That's great. And a question from Rihanna. Did postcards replace letters or did they serve a different function? They interwove. So typically it seems from the cards, um, a huge proportion of the cards refer to letters and cards. So, so people typically they also sent cards and received them when they were traveling. So so you didn't um, stop um sending cards when you were away from home you didn't stop receiving them even um and so for many people many correspondents like arthur and ruby for example then it's quite clear that they you know sometimes wrote a letter and sometimes sent a card sometimes a card is used almost as an apology for not having the time to write a letter but at the same time it carries the the extra kind of gift-like quality of including a picture although it's also cheaper That's great. And a question from Catherine. Can you see any interesting trends in the type of images chosen by certain senders or for certain recipients? Yes, yes, very much so. Um, I was actually um, led into this, that kind of a, a question by um, Peter Gildersdale in um, Auckland University of Technology, who was looking at hands across the sea card. And he drew my attention actually to the fact that there were there were fashions. So in 1904, for example, all the fashion was for sharing um, cards of celebrities, um, especially actresses. That doesn't mean that all cards were of actresses, but there, there was just great popularity. And indeed, actresses were making a lot of money from postcard contracts. And then suddenly, rather as things do, it, um, you know, that just became passe, that became last year's thing. And the next craze that came along was rough seas. So um, highly, often highly unrealistic um, pictures that we'd now call sort of photoshopped, we'd say, of um, uh, kind of seaside locations with dramatic uh, seas um, uh, rising up. That sounds quite like influencers today on Instagram and whatever else. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And cute cats, cute babies, that sort of thing, you know, pops, you know, features, features a lot as well. And I have a question from Debs. Um, you, you use the term meme, which yes. we associate with digital media. Can you say more about the similarities and differences? If memes are imitative and interactive, mm. are these images more associative and spatial? Great question. And sp spatial? Did was yes. Spatial. Um. 
I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. I certainly see lots of similarities. Um, the publishers were in a very competitive market. Um, you know, postcards were on sale everywhere and the rival publishers are very keen to get on the back of the latest trend. Um, so, so, for example, they want to, you know, a new humorous take on uh, babies or cats or whatever it might be, or indeed of certain sort of, as I say, ways of depicting places, such as um, ensuring that the sea is rough rather than calm. Um, so, so we do see these, these fashions change. We also have people, you could commission your own card, um, or of course you can use a plain card and decorate it yourself, or you can use a card and annotate it. Um, you know, that's that's a very popular thing to do, and I've got lots of examples of that as well. So I don't think I've answered your question properly, Debs, but I hope that's just a, a direction in the in the way. That's great, thanks, Debs. Um, Andrew, you've got your hand up. Hi, yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, and hi, Julie. I think we have uh, exchanged emails a month or so ago because of some research I'm doing in St. Anne's. Um, oh, yeah. Just wondered if the collection of postcards that you have, is it was it randomly collected or was it was it with some specific themes you were looking for or is it just whatever you could get your hands on? I collected cards that were um, inexpensive, um, that went through the post between um, 1901 and 1910, and I had a preference for cards, I think almost always I managed this, cards where I could make out at least a month and year of the postmark, if not the whole, um, if not the whole date, um, and where the uh, name of the addressee was readable so that I had a chance of being able to search for them in the census. Yeah. So I actually bought them with reference only to the backs um, and the price. So basically I, I sort of generally had a, a price maximum of 50p. So I would go to postcard sellers um, and look in their cheap boxes um, and buy and then turn the box around and buy them according to the backs. And I wouldn't find out what was on the picture side until I got them home. Yeah, so that so have you then researched most of the senders or receivers of the cards or just a few of them? All of them, all in the three, all in the main collection. Of course, some of them I can't find, but yeah. um, all of them I've, tr we, I've tried, yes, yeah. to find in the censuses. Yeah, so I suppose that research has led you towards the knowledge that most of them are sent by the working classes or the lower middle classes by and large. Yes, although it's actually interesting because that was one thing I wanted to know, you know, were they associated with a particular social class? And the answer is is no. I mean, obviously, if you're homeless, you couldn't. But I could find, for example, the daughter of a tin miner in um, Cornwall um, or a confectionery box maker living in a tiny room with her sister. And on the other hand, um, one was um, to a daughter of Lloyd George. Um, so I see them, so they, they really did. And also by the media discourses of the time, I can see that they really did um, cross social class and gender. Yeah, and it was cheap enough to send them for them to be yes. accessible to any. any sort yes, of I should have said that. It was half the price of a letter, a stamp yeah. was half the price of a letter, which is another reason for their appeal. Oh, that's great. Sounds really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. And I think one last question from Helmut. Can you tell me what technical system you are using for the citizen science transcription approach? Um, no, not really. I think um, I think would you mind would you mind emailing me, Helmut, please? Because I'd, I'd like to know more about what lies behind the question as well. So, 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 so may I keep that one for um for, for email? Great, great. Thanks, Helmut. So thanks very much, Julia. So it will be an opportunity for more general questions at the end of the session as well. So if you could stop sharing your screen, please. That's great, thank you. And we're now moving on to our 
second group of speakers, which is Kushi Gupta, Muskan Pal, and Ananya Pujari from Flame University in Pune, India. And they're going to be discussing Indian community cookbooks and archiving food histories. Ananya is an undergraduate pursuing a major in psychology and a minor in literary and cultural studies. And she's a keen interest in the intersections of culture, community, and mental health. Kushi is also an undergraduate and she's pursuing a marketing major with a focus in advertising and design. And she's particularly interested in creativity in advertising and design and how this relates to different food cuisines. Muskan's also an undergraduate and she is pursuing a degree in psychology with a minor in economics and sociology. And her interest lies in the behavioral sciences and intersecting that with digital humanities. So thanks very much, all of you. Um, if how are we going to do this? Sharing the slides from one of you, or um, I'll be sharing the slides. Yeah, that's great. Okay, Nanya. So if you can share, and then we'll get going. That's great. Thanks. Thanks. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. fab. Okay. So, good evening to everyone. Kushi Muskan and I are here to talk about our online archive, which is about Indian community cookbooks and oral food traditions. I initially came across this idea of digitizing recipes from personal experience. I am from the Tuluva community in Karnataka, and most of our community knowledge is orally transmitted, as we did not have a definite script. That includes traditional food recipes as well. There are so many communities like mine that rely solely on oral traditions. Speaking to people from these communities, I realized that there is this collective fear of losing these undocumented precious traditions, especially amongst diaspora populations. As a person living outside India myself, food is one of the few ways I can connect to my roots. An example, as an example, this cookbook was maintained by someone from the community who migrated to Mumbai in an effort to remember her traditional recipes. Furthermore, our, our team realized that there exists no comprehensive Indian cookbook repository which documents the diverse set of cuisines present in our country. We believe that cookbooks are more than just a collection of recipes. They are cultural artifacts that can document large-scale historical events like migration and globalization. While cookbooks make community recipes more widely available, the act of publication itself is a process of exclusion. Which cuisines get published and which do not? A survey on Indian cookbooks revealed that the author and the target audience tended to be from the upper or middle classes. Over the past few decades, Indian cuisine has also seen a nationalization, as observed by anthropologist Arjuna Puturai. Certain popular cuisines are being documented more than others, misrepresenting Indian cuisine as a whole. Thus, the Indian Community Cookbook Project seeks to integrate both of these essential aspects. Through this website, we hope to preserve as well as track the evolution of Indian cuisine. We have section for published cookbooks, cookbooks as well as family recipes, which Kushi will talk about now. <laughs> The Indian Community Cookbook Project focuses on three sections that are archives, timelines, and spatial mapping, which is called the modern cookbook story. Now coming to the archives. So uh, the British introduced India to the modern cookbook format, which, ex uh, which exists now. So uh, most of the recipes in their archives have been um, passed down orally from generations. So we have three types of archives um, in our website. So one is the printed, uh, so the Indian um, Pakistani cuisine by um, Zahra Asad is a printed archive. This is also a family recipe book, which has um, which has its focus on uh, the Indo-Pakistani cuisine. 
then second we have the handwritten archives um in which we have the konkani cuisine mangalorean cuisine and the sindhi cuisine so um then the third part is the recorded archives so we have both audio as well as video so uh, the bori i'll be uh, mutton curry recipe by mrs sara padaria um is an audio recording and um the second visual um the second video uh, recorded archive is the um is a bangalore muslim cuisine by mrs shakila begum and mr harif hussain so uh, we also got the nagaland recipes um nagaland cuisine recipes from um from a cast of a movie called the akuni and we had contacted them through our social media handle so we also have uh, two family recipes by one is by um sm joshua and the second one is by um zahra asad uh, which i had mentioned previously also so apart from these we also have recipes from um, kerala mangalore bangalore uttar pradesh and marathi communities of india so uh, for our archives our data collection method was through convenient sampling from our friends family and we also used the social media platform to get more recipes so coming to the next section timelines so timelines help in understanding uh, the chronological order of the published cookbooks so the main motive behind creating timelines was to uh, have a single repository for all the cookbooks so currently we have four timelines um, that is the anglo indian cuisine bengali cuisine goan cuisine and the tamil cuisine so the timelines we created using the night lab timeline software so now this is an example of a timeline the anglo indian cuisine so over here we have a list of cookbooks which are like uh, in a chronological order we have the name of the author written the the year it was published and also if there is an online version of the entire cookbook available then that link is also shown with the respective cookbooks over there yeah so so the timelines also track the external influences on cuisines over time and we have personally observed that there is a trend of accumulating macro communities rather than accumulating micro communities now over to uh, sorry yeah so the secondary data sources um, like blogs internet archives pinterest and purchase sites like amazons were used for our uh, data collection for the timelines and in the future we are planning on expanding it even more to include many more communities now over to ms khan she will be explaining about spatial mapping ushi so uh, for our final tool we have used spatial mapping to primarily document community cookbooks post 1990s industrialization in india and for this we have used arcgis's online mapping software so as you can see the yellow clusters represent cookbooks from macro communities so states like rajasthan where you have cookbooks like classic cooking of rajasthan or the cookbook of rajasthan and then you also have red clusters that represent specific location wise cookbooks for example the chettinad cookbook which is a region in tamil nadu's shivaganga district so it's a lot more specific in that sense um for the corroboration of these cookbooks like kushi mentioned earlier we have relied wholly on online sources and essentially the stool aims to ask the question of which cuisines are most prominently featured in cookbooks and by how much bringing back to the question of exclusion and inclusion and in doing so we hope that it gives a richer insight into the representation of communities as discrete culinary identities in contemporary cookbooks today so um i'll briefly conceptualize our project so far the project seeks to essentially map the evolution of indian cookbook history and for this we've used a variety of cultural mapping tools as you have seen but we have also gone beyond and try to account for intangible culinary heritage by collecting oral histories or generational handwritten family recipes and in doing so we aim to digitize discrete culinary community identities that are that have otherwise been forgotten 
via a process of homogenizing and nationalizing Indian cuisine. And lastly, this project above all seeks to be an open access resource for learning and further research. Of course, the project is not without its limitations. Um, due to the lack of its own domain, the project currently has limited visibility on the web, which results in limited reach to both the audience that can contribute to our repository, but also its utility as a resource. Moreover, majority of the cookbooks we collected thus far have been in English, and therefore there is a dearth in a consideration for cookbooks printed across several Indian languages. Um, moreover, like we mentioned earlier, due to a heavy online dependent methodology in place, our project is also limited in reach to communities that are not represented online. And some communities cannot be spatially located, for example, the Parsi communities. So in a nutshell, we hope to have through our project given you all an overview of India's tangible and intangible culinary history. And the cultural mapping tools that we've used have allowed us to conceptualize certain trends and make sense of cookbooks from various perspectives, be it a chronological change in the kinds of ingredients that are being used or the cooking methods or a spatial awareness of culinary identities. So to conclude, though currently our project is in a very nascent stage, we do want to make it grow and flourish for all the above mentioned reasons. So in the case that you are interested in getting to know more about us or you'd like to suggest resources that you think might be of use for us, or you wish to add to our repositories, you can get in touch with us. Please feel free to via the contact page on our website. And I think we can wrap it up here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, guys. This looks great, I have to say. This is a great resource. Um, and yes, we have quite a few questions. So I think we'll start with Rihanna, can cookbooks document religious differences or is it more closely related to different geographies and caste? Could I go first with answering that? Okay, so yes, no, definitely. I think that it does reflect a lot of religious changes. Of course, um, there are lots of caste-like differences that also are apparent via cookbooks. I mean, as far as we know, um, there is a great boundary in the resources available to some communities than they are to others. And a lot of the segregation is also further divided by religion and caste. So the kind of ingredients that some people use, the cooking methods that take place, they're not just limited to the geography. Rather, I do think they are a product of the religion, the caste, the social setting, the social structures that we have in place. So that definitely is reflected in the cook in the cookbooks that we've collected. Please feel free to add on if you'd like to. Um, yeah, the, the next question was from me and it was with the family recipe books. So I was thinking, at what point as a family do you write down your recipes? Like, how are these being produced? Because I can think of many recipes I would not want to record for posterity. Um, can I go? So I think um, like a lot of the recipes we collected were convenience samples. So we knew the people who we were collecting recipes from. And I think we first had to sort of build that trust that their recipes were in safe hands. And <laughs> yeah, I think that personal connection is really important when you're sharing these really intimate recipes. Also, if I may add on to that, I think that in the larger scheme of things, food is one of the facets of your culture or your history or your heritage. That is also something that you want to preserve and protect. And I think in a country like India, where lots of mass migration happens, where people are moving from 
rural to urban settings or they're moving within states, a lot of this need to preserve and protect kind of plays into the motivation of documenting or actually starting to document these recipes. That's, that's really interesting, yeah. Because there seems to be a big thing at the moment, even in Britain, around food heritage and trying to recreate old recipes. Have you, have you tried to do any of the recipes out of interest? Yeah. It, it, <laughs> yeah. it worked off really well, actually. I, I don't I didn't have some of the ingredients, of course, but other than that, it worked off really well. Yes, I've tried a couple of recipes which we've got. So yeah. Oh, well, we've got a, a question from Debs. I'm happy uh, to say it out loud. Yeah, go you. on. I was, well, I was just think this is a fantastic exercise in um, critical and reflective archive making. And I wanted to ask a sort of general question about how you factored in the question of change, because we know that in the periods when people start writing cookbooks, diets are being completely transformed. I mean, particularly community diets are being transformed. Um, and urban rural migration is transforming diets. And I suppose I also wanted to ask about how, whether you've reflected on how this project might intersect with the quite political debates about vegetarianism, which is often claimed as being a sort of general condition of the Indian diet, which is both a political claim and also a wholly inaccurate claim, but also the even more political questions of beef consumption and questions of caste identity in relation to beef consumption. Okay, I'll have a stab at it first and then please feel free to add on to it. Um, I'll answer the last most question that you had about the political nature of the cookbooks. Um, I feel like in our experience so far, we have been documenting cookbooks that are not as recent. Of course, we have had contemporary cookbooks in place, but in general, our repository hasn't been one that is uh, representative of the current day and time, if I, if I can say that. So I feel like in the past, a lot of these things that get reflected in cookbooks, um, of course, they're reflective of historical, political, social, cultural, economic situations, but I feel like they're not as easily um, visible or evident when at, at least because we are curating the cookbooks, but when it comes to the actual um, finding of these cookbooks for us, a big limitation has been to get access of these cookbooks in whole, which means that we do know that a cookbook is there, but we don't have access to it in its entirety. So I feel like that limitation kind of really puts us behind in terms of deciphering a lot of these um, conditions, political, socioeconomic, a lot of these conditions that can otherwise be reflected within the cookbook itself. I feel like that has been a great limitation for us in terms of our project, which is something that we definitely want to tackle at some point in time. I mean, that would be great. Uh, Ananya Khushi, please feel free to add. Yeah, I think we require like a on-field study of some sorts to get access to these cookbooks, which we haven't been able to do yet. So hopefully at some time. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. Thank you. Um, oh, we've got a question from Bethany as well. And she asks, do the printed recipes differ from the family recipes? I think the printed recipes, the kind of general state books, um, because of the intended audience. And who are the kind of publicly printed books for? So um, I'm guessing you're talking about the family recipe books that Kushi mentioned, right? The Indo-Pakistani dishes, not necessarily printed cookbooks, but printed family recipe cookbooks, right? And 
I'm going to go ahead with that. Um, so I think that uh, the general need for preservation, I think printing does a great job at solidifying that because it's a lot more stable of a medium than handwritten or oral transmission. So I feel like in that sense, um, also because recipes that go from family to family have like a secretive layer to it, like usually recipes only run within the family. And as far as we know, a lot of these families, if they do have um, familiar, re familiar recipes that they do want to protect, then they usually only disclose these recipes to their sons and not their daughters because their daughters will get married and um, then the, after marriage, the daughters will be a part of another family. So in order to preserve the secrecy behind a familial recipe, that entire the lineage of a culinary like heritage only goes through the sons of the family. And so I feel like in that sense, it goes both ways. I feel like printing as a medium works best, but also in my, like in another opinion, I feel like that in turn is also a turning point in history where people stopped being so secret about their recipes, if that makes sense. Yeah. I had a, a final question about the mapping so when you were creating the map of all the different cookbooks, especially some of the older ones, did you have any trouble with place names having changed or disambiguate different locations and working out exactly what was covered by a certain region in some cases? Definitely, actually, we have. <laughs> and, and that is precisely why we have a distinction between specific location-wise cookbooks and the state-wise cookbooks. Because for a lot of these cookbooks, they're very ambiguous about their locations. And so the next best thing is to kind of understand them within their state or within the larger region or within the macro community they are based in. So that is definitely a problem that we have had, which is why we have the yellow clusters on the map and the red clusters on the map. So yeah. Definitely. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's a good way of doing it. It saves you a lot of pain. Well, thank you very much. This is brilliant. Um, and I think Catherine's put a link in the chat if anyone wants to go and have a look at the website. So you can go and have a go at cooking old Indian recipes. Thank you. So thanks, guys. Um, up next, we have more recipes. Um, this time we have Julia Eiblinger, Chris Trauber and Helmut Klug from the University of Graz in Austria. And they're going to be taking us through semantic annotation of recipes as intangible heritage. Um, Helmut is a trained medievalist with strong interests in digital humanities. And his research focuses on culinary history, dietetics and plant law of the Middle Ages. And he's a postdoc researcher at the Centre for Information Modelling at the University of Graz. Christian is a um, master in translation English, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, and is a, doing a joint master's at Euromax. Digital Humanities Centre for Information Modelling, also in Graz. He's a PhD student and research assistant in the Cooking Recipes of Middle Ages project, which you're going to hear about today. And he's particularly interested in semantic modelling and the semantic web in this area. Julia is a Digital Humanities Master's student, also at Graz. And she, she's an assistant to the Cooking Recipes of Middle Ages project. She has a bachelor's in German studies and has a focus in German medieval studies. So more food sounds great. So if Julia, Christian and Helmut are ready, um, that's great, thanks Helmut. 
yeah we can see that so yeah whenever you're ready okay you get, yeah thank you for having us uh, we represent the Austrian French research project Corema cooking recipes of the Middle Ages and we are interested in this the semantic aspect of these cooking recipes our focus is medieval culinary research and in our research project we work with German, French and Latin cooking recipes and by comparing the recipes we want to learn about the different cooking and eating, eating habits of French and German peoples and we're especially interested uh, in recipes that are known to uh, both groups uh, and recipes that are handed down in all three language groups and for that we have a corpus of uh, 90 recipe collections which hand down about 8,000 recipes uh, yeah this is uh, the slide to what I just said and you can see that the that the German language recipes uh, compared to other European languages is uh, the biggest group. Um, yeah, what uh, I believe is that in a historical perspective, a cooking recipe is one of the most intimate sources for people's eating habits because recipes, especially historical recipes, can be attributed to individual persons. Of course, they can also be attributed to households, to certain geographical regions, or even to social groups. Uh, as a collection or as cookbooks, recipes are the most important manifestation of historical and contemporary food ways. When working with historical texts, uh, researchers tend to uh, come to some sort of problems. Uh, because we need to work, we need we have to work with uh, texts that have, that are unstable in spelling and in grammar, and we need to compare these texts. And what is more is we need to compare texts in different languages. So our approach was not to analyze the recipe texts, but analyze the recipes at a semantic level. And the basis for that is the Corema semantic model. Uh, it provides means to model the macrostructure of the recipes and at the same time it allows us to annotate the texts on a micro level. All the annotations and all the data uh, is available in the de facto standard of the text encoding initiative, but of course we introduce uh, project spe specific extensions. And uh, we believe that the model is built so flexible uh, that we can not only encode historic recipes, but also modern recipes. And uh, I also think that we can uh, use the model for other domains like medical recipes. Julia will now tell you more about uh, the modeling of the texts and then Christian will tell you how we use the semantic annotation to connect our historic sources to the linked open data cloud. Thank you. Well, as Helen said, the semantic model was created based on our recipe corpus, meaning the Corma project recipe corpus, but it aims at a broader usability and future reuse. So the annotation is not only limited to elements specific to the cooking process, but it also entails serving suggestions, dietetic information, suggestions concerning the household and passage of time, and many more. Here you can see the first part of our semantic annotation workflow, the macrostructure. Our workflow of annotation is a semi-automatic process and it consists of two parts. The macrostructure is the first. You can see here uh, the web view on our web page. Um, and during the manual annotation of the macrostructure, phrases or even single words are tagged by hand uh, and here you can see them highlighted in different colors. 
there is a variety of elements available to annotate a variety of different semantic values. The base element of the microstructure is the AB element, which defines a type of text entity. You can see here on the slide three different entities. The first is a kitchen tip that advises on seasonal cookery. The second is a medicinal recipe which advises on dish consumption during summer. And the third is a cooking recipe for red, white bread puree. Uh, the second base element is the instruction, which you can see here in a brown color. And it tags a single distinct step of action in the cooking process. The annotation is generally linked to one word phrase, but elliptical emissions are possible and indeed very frequent. In the first text in yellow, you can see, for example, the tagging of the month May as a date, as well as the element of the opener, which is present in all three text entities. In the first, it is the item to sort kochen, and in the uh, second and third, it's just the word, the Latin phrase item. Uh, the opener, in this case, describes an optional stereotype introductory phase. In the second text entity in blue, you can, for example, see the mentioning of an alternative, namely kochen oder pachen, which means two different uh, cooking versions, meaning cooking or baking. These types of elements, such as tips, need to be annotated by hand because their semantic information has to be evaluated by a person in order to assign the proper tag, tag, which means we cannot yet do this in a standardized way, so we have to read and tag manually. Uh, the second step is the automatic step of annotating the microstructure, and I would ask Helen to change the slide, please. Thank you. Here you can see uh, the second step in the process, the automatic annotation of ingredients, dishes, and tools. And these elements make up the microstructure of the recipe text. We use a Python script, script which compares strings from three different CSV lists with the strings in our normalized XMLTI file. And it adds the corresponding tags automatically. The elements include the modern English translation, which you can see here, as well as the Wikidata concept as an attribute. Christian will tell you all about Wikidata in a bit. In the web here, you can see the translation for the ingredients, for example, the chicken breast, the chicken egg, and so on. After a first run of the script, we read through to find not annotated spellings, which means they are not yet uh, available in the list, and we add them from there, which enhances the range of spellings after each annotation and lowering the workforce with, workload with each uh, annotated manuscript. The automatic annotation needs to be proofread as spellings can be and are quite often ambiguous and not all spellings may be already present in the CSV list as I already said and those need to be added. Furthermore, the medieval cooking recipes oftentimes include comparisons as well as replicas which you can see here in the first cooking recipe where morals are made out of chicken uh, and so the moral as an ingredient is not really used in the recipe and so as to not falsify any included ingredients, we also added the attribute of comparison or analogy as to filter those out. And I give to Christian. So you might ask yourself, why do we do all this? It's a lot of work. Um, and the answer is because we want to be part of uh, the bigger picture. We want to be part of the so-called linked open data cloud, um, which is on the next slide. Whoever does change the slides. Helmut? Yeah. Um, and the linked open data cloud is composed of structured data. All all of these data sets are highly structured. They are um, um, stored in so-called RDF triples. Uh, and they're again interlinked with other structured data. And they all use URIs and RDF data to, um, to do this. And uh, in the end, what everyone wants is 
to have uh, a source for useful semantic queries. And that's why um, we want to be part of this, uh, of this huge cloud as well, so that we can do useful semantic queries with our data, um, but not just with our data. Um, the big advantage of being part of the cloud and structuring your data in this way and annotating your data in this way is that we can be part of uh, of a network from uh, different domains all over the world, uh, different domains from, from everything you could imagine that could interconnect with our data. Um, we use Wikidata at the moment for uh, as a data hub, so to say, um, where we can uh, we can have our data uh, in Wikidata and as well connect to other data, especially from the life sciences that have um, um, important resources and food as well. Um, it's the following slide. <laughs> and uh, Wikidata is basically Wikipedia for machines. So whatever we uh, as humans read in a Wikipedia article, a computer can read in Wikidata. And this data um, we can query and we can ask uh, questions that we can't ask Google, for instance. And in this way, the Corima project becomes a huge graph. Uh, in the next slide, we can see that. Um, this is basically what Corima becomes if we look at it from uh, from the side of the data, if we look at it from how a computer would look at it. Uh, and this opens up new opportunities. This opens up a whole new world of possibilities that um, we could now do with data that we couldn't if we just um, had it annotated in a traditional way and without um, generating RDF triples, without being part of the linked open data cloud. Yep, that's the next site, and and that's the uh, that's the end. Sorry for the <laughs> for um, the the slight um, time lag. Th thanks very much, guys. That's really interesting. Um, I have a quick question. If I can jump in first about the. Um, Wikidata links and the semantic website of it. So you, you mentioned at the moment Wikidata, you can link to life sciences data. How easy is it with your model that you've made for this project to link into other historical linked open data? Um, we for for this part we actually leave out the historical aspect because an apple for us is still an apple it's not it's not the historic apple because we don't really know what it, what it is we don't really know which apple exactly they mean in the recipes um so we just we just uh, annotate it as an apple and we use the, the concept of the modern apple as we can we all know how an apple looks like and and wikidata has this concept of an apple it's q89 is is basically it's the id for apple and then and then we have hundreds of languages um and and there is loads of statements attached to this one id to this one concept of apple and that's how we can um connect our concept of apple that it's found in our recipes with, uh, for instance, the nutritional values of a modern apple. Um, but we ha have to ignore the nutrition values of a medieval apple because there's simply no way to find out. That makes sense, yeah. Um, I, I had another question. I think it was on one of the first slides where Helmut was introducing the corpus if I've understood this correctly. So most of the recipes are German language texts. 
Um, but from this slide, it looks like most of the records you found are in London. Is that correct? Um, uh, partly. Uh, the map I showed is uh, a map of the total European medieval culinary heritage. And uh, London has uh, the most, the, the biggest collections of manuscripts. Uh, therefore, the, the dot was uh, dark green. Uh, but besides uh, German, uh, English culinary heritage has uh, the most um, historical sources that, that are handed down, that are available, uh, available at the moment. I was, I was thinking when Julie was explaining kind of the manual process of tagging all the features in the text to produce the annotations. Presumably, you said some of them have been translated, so those annotations would work for different languages? Yes. Uh, that's that's actually that's actually what what we are aiming at because we have texts in Latin, we have texts in in medieval German and texts in medieval French, uh, and to and for being able to compare the the French, the Latin, and the German recipes, we need a common denominator, and this common denominator is as as Christian explained uh, the Wikidata number, and with the Wikidata number come comes uh, the, the English translation or any other language that is available on Wikidata. So uh, the semantic data of the recipes uh, could easily be um, provided in, in any, any language uh, available on Wikidata. I just wonder if using the kind of semantic data as a starting point, you could almost do some linguistic comparisons there as well. Yes, because uh, we have, especially historical linguistics, because uh, we not only have uh, the different spelling variants of, of, for example, ingredients, but we also have the phrases uh, that are uh, in, in, uh, instructions. For example, uh, take an apple, or you have to cut, uh, cut it quite fine, something like that. So we can both look at, phrase, or we could look at phrases and we can uh, look at the lexicon. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, oh, we've got a question from Debs. So can the spatial analysis of the annotated texts tell us about or be linked with data relating to markets, production or subsistence? Um, it, yeah, well, uh, this depends on, on how you phrase the question exactly. Uh, we can say uh, that at a certain time, at a certain region, these recipes were known. But we cannot say that these recipes were cooked. Uh, for that information, we would need uh, information on uh, tax records or something like that so that we know okay at this point uh, sugar was available at let's say Vienna then we can say okay we have this ingredient uh, at that time at that place and then we can look at, at the cooking recipes so uh, it's it's uh, rather not uh, a source for uh, doing uh, uh, detailed spatial analysis. That's great, okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I think I was thinking far too literally about the relationship between cookery, books and eating. Um, and my own kitchen shelves should have warned me against making that connection <laughs> too immediately. I had kind of one final comment with this. We're thinking back to the Indian cooking heritage and digitization of that. I mean, presumably the kind of model you're producing here and by linking it into the semantic data cloud, you could adapt this model for use on any sort of, not even just recipes, but intangible heritage of any kind in theory.
Yes, uh, this is this is why we're doing it. Maybe Christian can uh, elaborate on this point some more. Um, well, the RDF model definitely can be interlinked with any other uh, data that is also exposed as RDF. So um, if we stick to the, the, the Indian cooking recipes, that would be no problem at all because um, they're in the same domain anyway, but also different domains, which is if we find a common vocabulary, that's how they call it in the linked open data. It's, 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 uh, they're all ontologies basically. Uh, and they can be used uh, together and we can, we can all, we can define concepts with the same vocabulary that come from completely different domains. So it's definitely possible to, to do that. But um, we could also use our semantic XML model that you, Julia, explained um, for modern recipes. For instance, the Indian recipes would definitely work, I think. Um, but that's uh, another level of annotation. In the end, when it's all just triples, it doesn't really matter where which domain the, the, the data comes from. So one example could be that uh, we linked our uh, ingredients um, database uh, to another database via the, the Wikidata uh, concepts to another database that has information on flavors. Uh, and uh, we tried to, to have a look at the uh, recipe collections and uh, after having done it, I like to look at it as, as a kind of distant reading because we have uh, inferred, uh, a, a, although related, a, complete, a completely different category on the recipes. And we are not watching the recipes as text, but uh, as, as Christian showed it, we are watching them as different graphs. And we had a radar chart depicting the, the different uh, flavor groups of uh, the recipe collections. So it, it's absolutely possible to, to connect to, to other domains and to, to other databases. That was great. That, that could be yeah, some fascinating collaborations there in the future. Um, oh, a question from Rihanna. Have any of the ingredients you've come across in the recipes surprised you? And have they perhaps suggested links between geographies you didn't know existed? Yes, so when I first started with the annotation process, I was uh, fairly new to the uh, early New High German cooking recipes, and there you find a lot of different ingredients which would not be used today under normal circumstances, for example, using fish scales for a speech or um, different kind of uh, pig feeds for the same purpose as gelatin is not yet available in sheets as one would use today. But for example, we can find a lot of, um, just last week I finished annotation of a manuscript which was, uh, had its roots in uh, Byzantine and Arabic um, regions. So there you can see a huge difference in the use of uh, different spices, for example. So you have a wide variety of different um, combinations of ingredients in the manuscripts, for example, which leads to a different variety of uh, combinations and flavor profiles, which are significant to one manuscript, but might not be found in another one. That's great, thanks. Oh, thanks very much, guys. This has been really interesting. Um, I had a, a question for all the speakers just on this, this theme of digitization. So it occurred to me, even with the recipes here, you're dealing with handwritten medieval text, you're dealing with handwritten postcards and Julia's example. Uh, even with the, the Indian recipes being digitized, they're still 
digitized handwritten text. So is there, I wondered if in all of these cases, in terms of deciphering handwritten texts, or did all of you still primarily do this manually? Was there a lot of manual effort involved here? Or is there any OCR or things like that? In my case, um, manual efforts, totally manual efforts. I don't think anything else can work. And one reason is the um, the un kind of unpredictable direction of uh, of the the handwriting. You know, it, it doesn't go left to right, top to, top down. Um, so yes, a lot of efforts been being needed for the uh, transcription. It's taken place over many years of the main collection. Same here. We've also largely relied on personal efforts <laughs> to transcribe. That's that's also one of the reasons why we haven't relied on translation and rather we've only transcribed the material that we've collected. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think we, we often hear about all oh, OCR and automation and we can do all this stuff and it just doesn't work <laughs> in my experience. Ah, yes, Debs has mentioned Transcribus in the chat. Um, uh, we did actually work with Transcribus in the Corama project, but we did not, we did not use the automatic uh, features. So um, we used it as a transcription tool, basically, um, being fully aware of its automatic handwritten recognition features and the possibility of training the, the software, but which has had too many different um, manuscripts and it wouldn't have paid off. But uh, Transcribers is uh, a wonderful tool, I think, and uh, for, for many use cases, it's totally possible to at least semi-automatically transcribe. And I think in the future, um, we'll be better and better. And uh, we, we won't rely so much as, as we do now on, on human transcriptions, but only human uh, error readings or proofreading. Um, yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, just just to add here, uh, we have used the automatic layout detection feature for um, available in Transcribus, uh, which uh, gave us the text region of a page and the the regions of the lines, and uh, in in uh, to a very large extent, this worked really flawlessly. And uh, to add here, uh, in a follow up project, we. Uh, are going to deal with the automatic uh, um, hand handwriting detection of transcribus. So maybe sometime we can talk about that. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how how that goes. Um, I was wondering, especially in in your case, Christian and Helmut, whether having different languages makes that harder. Um, I don't know if, if uh, this is a problem uh, because, yeah, well, of course, you need the trained model to, to uh, being able to use it. So, and, and the model does not, it, it doesn't look at um, characters, but it looks at the pictures of words. So you need a base text, the, the model can be trained on and the text, these texts then need to be, in our case, uh, would need to be uh, German, French, and Latin. The handwriting uh, is, isn't that uh, that a big problem because uh, we're dealing with uh, medieval bastarda, which is uh, 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 handwriting used uh, at, at that time. Uh, and of course, there are uh, deviations from, from uh, something uh, uh, like the norm, but it, it's in, in very, in, many cases it's it's very similar so uh the machine should actually be able to deal with that because I, I was thinking with the indian cookbooks as well if 
when you guys actually get a chance to get your hands on real books, um, perhaps in many different regional languages that probably have never been fed into a model. I imagine that would have to be manual to start with at least. Yeah, of course, uh, uh, the, each, each model training um, has to start manually because you need to input the text you need you you need to give the machine uh, uh, the correct the, the correct uh, layout and the correct wording so that the machine can learn from from these images that makes sense have we got any more general questions from the audience If not, I think it's a chance to wrap up and say thanks again to all our speakers. Three really interesting presentations and I'm very hungry now, I have to say. All the recipes are looking fantastic. I think there's um, different approaches on show as well. The semantic approach and the future possibilities are really interesting. So it would be great to see how these progress. So thanks very much for coming on.